Welcome to a study in the book of Revelation, Revealing the Coming King. My name is Chris Menefee. I'm the pastor and missionary at First Vision Baptist Church in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I am praying and hoping that this study will be a blessing to you in your understanding of the book of Revelation. And more importantly, in the one that that book reveals, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I've heard it said that the study of prophecy either finds a man mad or leaves him that way. I'm hoping that that won't be the case in our study. To really benefit from a study of the book of Revelation, you have to understand the purpose of the book. That purpose is not to give us the exact time and place in which the Lord is coming back. Uh, it is not to allow us to set dates. Uh, in fact, the world and history has been filled with people who have attempted to do just exactly that and made themselves look extremely foolish as well as bringing shame and disrepute upon the name upon the uh, work of Christ the purpose of the book of Revelation is to show us Jesus Christ it is not so much about knowing when the Lord will come back as it is about knowing that the Lord will come back it is a book especially written for those who will be in the midst of that great tribulation to know that there is hope, to know that this is not the end, but that this is the beginning of eternity itself. So let's take a look at a few things in the book of Revelation as we begin just looking at the introduction to the book. And in the next coming weeks, we'll spend more time in the details of the book as well. Let's take a look at some stats about the book of Revelation. The author of the book of Revelation is John the Apostle. He is also called the Beloved. He's also called the Evangelist. John was the first cousin of Jesus Christ and was the closest to Jesus Christ. It's interesting that he is the one who is called upon to write this book. The book was written in about 96 AD and it was sent to the seven churches of Asia. The title for the book comes from the, the first word in the Greek New Testament, Apocalypsis, and we have taken and just transliterated that into English as Apocalypse. That word literally means an unveiling or an uncovering something that is hidden. It is not a word that means catastrophe. It is not a world, word that means uh, end of the world. Uh, it is simply a word that says the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ. And that is the purpose of the book. It is to show us the one who is coming. All of the book of Revelation and all of the Bible must be centered upon Jesus Christ. Once we lose that perspective and start making it into something it was never meant to be, we run into problems and our Christianity becomes something less than what it should be and our Bible study is not nearly as profitable as it should be. We need to be looking at this book and understanding and realizing it is about us going, coming to know Jesus Christ. Now in that role of future king, no longer the lion, no longer the lamb, but now the lamb, the lion of Judah coming to reclaim that which is his. Let's go back and look at a few more things about the book. As we study the book of Revelation, we need to have some understanding of the different ways in which the book itself is looked at. How do people interpret it? One of the ways is that it is symbolic. That is only a series of pictures teaching spiritual truths. Those who view the book of Revelation in this way would also view the rest of the Bible this way. That it is not a book that has any real historical value or scientific value, but it is a book that can teach us spiritual things. It is a book for applying things to our life but it is not a book of reality. The preacher's view is uh, the view that the book of Revelation is history. It's already fulfilled in the first century, and some will take it all the way up into World War I, World War II. This view is especially popular with the Catholic Church because throughout the centuries, the Catholic Church has been viewed as uh, the woman who rides the Scarlet Beast. And because of that, in order to dodge that interpretation, it has uh, taken a look and said, no, these things aren't future. These are things that are taking place in the past. And therefore, this can't have anything to do with us. 
the preacher's view. Another view is the continuous, and that is that his history mostly fulfilled since Christ until now. Again, this is another way of looking at the book of Revelation as something that is past or is continuing to pass, but has nothing to do with us knowing the future. And then there is the futurist view. That view says that except for chapters 1 through 3, all is still future. Those who would interpret the Bible literally can't help but see the book of Revelation as a futurist book. It talks about the things that will be, just as it says in the book of Revelation, the things that will come. It is not a book about history. It is not a book about history that has passed, but it is a book that is telling us what to look for when Jesus Christ comes back and to know and understand that no matter how dark it gets, no matter how difficult it may seem, Jesus Christ is coming back and all these things are under his control. We also need to have an understanding of the different views of the rapture, which is something that uh, if we're not sure of where we stand on the rapture, then we're not going to be sure about how we interpret the rest of this book. There's the pre-tribulational rapture, which is what most conservative, uh, uh, literal scholars of the Bible believe. And that is that Christ will rapture or take out his saints before the tribulation starts. There's also the mid-tribulational rapture. And this puts the rapture at the midpoint uh, of the tribulation, I should say. And finally, there is the post-tribulational, and that is that the rapture will occur at the end of the tribulation. Baptists historically have been pre-tribulational. And the reason for that is because the book of Revelation is a book that deals with Jesus' people, or Jesus' nation, the nation of Israel. The church age ends before the last week in, of Daniel's uh, 70th week begins, before the Great Tribulation begins. And it is about the Jewish people coming back to Christ. It is not about the church. It is written for the Jewish people, it is written to the Jewish people, and it is their book of comfort when they go through that trial waiting for their true Messiah to come. As such, it has nothing to do with us as the, as the Christian church today. The Tribulation is designed to punish the world. Uh, God has no reason to punish His church. We've accepted Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and we have uh, been saved and, and forgiven our sin. Um, we know Jesus is our Messiah and our Lord. Uh, we do not have to learn that lesson through the fires of the Great Tribulation. There is no purpose for the church going through the Great Tribulation. The purpose of the Great Tribulation is to reveal to Jesus Christ to those who don't see him now, to a world that has rejected him, and to his nation Israel, which will then at that point accept him. So we are pre-tribulational. We also want to look a little bit at the millennial views, just so we have an understanding of the terms. There is a premillennialism, which is the belief that Christ will come to earth before the thousand year reign, before the thousand year reign of Christ foretold in the book of Revelation. There's post-millennial. This is a belief that Christ will come to earth after the thousand years is over. And there's amillennial, which is to say there is no little reign of Christ for a thousand years. According to the book of Revelation, seven times in one chapter, it says that Christ will come and rule and reign on the earth after the tribulation. If we are literal in our view of the Bible, if we are conservative in the way we interpret the Bible, then we're left with just one option, one choice, and that simply is that we are premillennial, that Christ will come back before the millennium, set up his kingdom, and rule and reign for a thousand years upon the earth. I also want you to understand the terms dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is an approach to biblical interpretation which states that God uses different means of administrating and revealing his will to people during different periods of history. Usually, seven chronologically successive periods, it attempts a literal interpretation of scripture with a premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture view that sees Israel and the church as distinct bodies. Here's a list of the dispensations as they are usually presented by most uh, conservative uh, literal interpreters of the Bible. 
each of the dispensations is marked uh, at the beginning and at the end with a remarkable event, something huge, something outstanding. Um, they often have to do with judgment uh, and especially have to do with revelation. A dispensation does not mean that man is saved in a different way. It simply means that God is using a different means to reveal himself and to show his will to those people who live during that time. So the dispensations you can see over on the right hand side are the dispensation of innocence, then conscience, government, faith, law, grace, also called the church age, and righteousness, also called the millennial age or dispensation. And these events on the left hand side mark the beginning and the end of each of these dispensations. The dispensation of innocence ran from Adam until the fall. Again, man's sin and God's judgment. The age of conscience in which God dealt to man with through his conscience was from the fall into the flood. Again, uh, a judgment that marks the end and the beginning. After the flood, God deals with man through the governments of the earth, the kings and the rulers. That ends with Abraham and we begin the dispensation of faith in which the promises that God gave and the covenant that God gave to Abraham form the means by which he will reveal himself to them. That ends at Sinai when the law was given to Moses and uh, the period of the law ends at the cross and from the time of Christ's death until his return God reveals himself through grace. He reveals himself through the church age. Again, not a different kind of salvation but a different means of revelation. It is now the gospel and the uh, news, the story of Jesus Christ by which God reveals himself to man. No longer the law, no longer innocence or conscience, but now grace. And finally, with the return of Christ, we enter into the time of the millennium, the righteous dispensation. A time period in which um, Jesus Christ himself will be ruling and reigning from Israel, from Mount Zion, and the nations of the earth can literally flow into Zion and they can listen and sit at the feet of Christ himself. And so that is a different means by which he is going to reveal himself and there will not be the means that are in, in place now because Christ himself will be the one who tells and Christ himself will be the one who shows righteousness. To really understand the book of Revelation, you must understand Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. This is the 70, 70 weeks of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the uh, purpose of the book of uh, Daniel is given, or the 70 weeks prophecy is given. So important was this prophecy that when we read in the book of Daniel, we find that Daniel, after reading in the book of Jeremiah, another of the prophets, that God had given 70 years for his people to be in captivity. And they were ending or coming near to the end of that time period. And Daniel looked around at his people and still saw them caught up in the same sins that had brought them into captivity. And he begins to pray, Lord, how can this be that you're going to release your people, you're going to send them back to Israel, when they're still sinful, when they still have not learned the lesson. And so God sends uh, an answer to Daniel through an angel. And so incredibly important was this answer that Satan himself, the Bible says, rose up and tried to stop that heavenly messenger from getting to Daniel and telling him how God was going to bring his people back to himself. Um, so intense was that fight that that angel had to call for Michael, the archangel, who is the only one equal in power to Satan uh, in heaven itself, except for God, who is more powerful. And in a sense, he did an end run after that battle took place between Satan and Michael, and uh, the angel brought the message to Daniel. And so in it, we have the very key to God's plan, God's program for all the ages. So let's take a look again at the purpose of the prophecy that Daniel was given. The angel said to Daniel, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, that's the first purpose, to make an end of sins, the second, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most High. So the prophecy was given for the purpose of God bringing God's people back to themselves, back to God, ending the sin, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. So we know we're looking at 
the millennial kingdom to seal up the vision and the prophecy. This is the end. There will be no more after this. And to anoint the most holy, which is a reference to the Messiah. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 20 says, And them that escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. And so Daniel read that prophecy of Jeremiah that God was going to take his people out of the land of Israel for 70 years, and that was the time period in which they should have been celebrating the Sabbath years and the Jubilees, and they did not. And God said, so that those Sabbath years will be fulfilled, I'm going to remove you for the same number of years that you should have let the land lay fallow. You should have been celebrating the Sabbath years, and they never did. And so Daniel reads that, he prays, the angel finally rises and tells him, this is the whole understanding of it. This is the entire plan that God has for the ages. It's not just the 70 years that uh, the people of Israel are going to be in captivity, but it is actually 490 years, 70 weeks of years. So let's take a look now a little bit more at Daniel chapter 7, at Daniel chapter 9. The key to biblical prophecy. The first thing we have to understand is what is this time period called a week? It comes from the Hebrew word Shabuah, which means seven or a period of seven. It can be days, it can be years, it can be weeks. It just means a group of seven, a heptad. So looking at that uh, prophecy, when would those 70 weeks begin? Uh, in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 9 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the prophecy that uh, Daniel uh, was told about begins when the command goes forward that the walls of Jerusalem could be rebuilt. That took place under Ezra and Nehemiah. And we can actually go and look at the exact month and year in which that decree went forth. It's a part of archaeological discovery. And the prophecy says that it would take seven weeks, that's uh, 49 years, for the wall to be rebuilt. And then after that, until Messiah the Prince, would be three score and two weeks. And so you add all that together, and you come up to an exact time, an exact date, within a month, within that month, that the Messiah would come. The Messiah coming had to be that first part of that vision. So Messiah would be revealed at the 69th week. The Messiah would be cut off after three score and two weeks. And it says, but not for himself. So sometime after the 69th week, we're told the Messiah would be cut off. Then it says also in this prophecy, who will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and when will that take place? It says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and all we're told is that it will take place after the 69th week. After Messiah is cut off, there is only one week left. Seventy, the total uh, number of weeks in the vision, minus the 69, which would give us the uh, revealing of Messiah and his cutting off, leaves us one week. We're even told when that one week then would begin. It begins when he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That he is the coming prince of verse 26. When he confirms the covenant, then the prophecy, the last final week of Daniel's 70 week uh, vision begins. We're told that there is a, also a mark in the middle of that final week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Daniel was given this vision, told that in so many years, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. So many years after that, Messiah will come. And this can all be traced back historically as well as biblically. And we know that when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, 
and was anointed, was seen as the anointed of God, the Messiah, by the people, and they broke off the palm branches, and they spread out their cloths, and they, they sung out, Hosanna to the highest, and they hailed him as their Messiah. That was the revealing of the Messiah. And in just a few short days after that, he was killed, he was cut off. And with that, the 69th week is marked and ended. One way we could understand this is that is that God, with that proclamation to rebuild Jerusalem, started a stopwatch. And that stopwatch ran continuously until the Messiah was cut off and then it was stopped again. We see this in the way that it's written. After the 69th week, we're not told any other specific dates until the final week starts. And so God stopped that. And for now, over 2,000 years, that stopwatch has been stopped. And God's finger has been poised over that switch to start it again, waiting for that time period in which the church age is over with, the Gentiles are gathered in, and this time of grace in which God has, has been gathering unto himself a people other than the Jewish people, other than the nation of Israel. And he is gathering them up over these centuries, and we're just waiting now for that time period in which God clicks the stopwatch and it starts running and we'll have seven years, just seven years left in which man's history and the age of the Gentiles will finally end. The time of Jacob's sorrow, the Bible refers to it. The 70th week of Daniel, the book of Revelation is the full um, show, the full revealing of that plan and Jesus Christ coming at the end of that to take charge of that which is rightfully his. Let's look at a chart, give you a little bit more detail. In 445 BC, the proclamation was given that um, Jerusalem should be built. Uh, the king Cyrus gave it to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, who is his cupbearer, his food taster, um, almost in a sense his prime minister. But he gave him that decree, and he went back to Jerusalem, and in 49 years they rebuilt the wall, just as the prophecy said. Plus that, 62 weeks, and we come to the time in which Jesus revealed. So we have a total of 483 years out of this 490-year prophecy, and Messiah was revealed. That takes place in 30 AD at the triumphal entry. And this was prophesied in Zechariah 9, verse 9, and it's fulfilled in Matthew 21, 1 through 12, also Mark 11, Luke 19, John 12, 12. All the Gospels recorded because it was the fundamental, seminal event that marked Jesus Christ as Messiah. Every, every Jewish person, you didn't have to be a, a priest or a scholar or a scribe, but to know this, the one sign they looked for, the one thing that above all of the things that would reveal to them the Messiah was Zechariah 9, verse 9, where it says, Behold, thy king shall come to thee meek and lowly, riding upon an ass and the foal of an ass. And so when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, that the few days before Passover, sit it upon that donkey, the people know for about three, three and a half years before this time period, they've heard rumors. Some say yes, some say no. Uh, but when he rides into Jerusalem, that is an open declaration that he is the Messiah. And the people erupt in joy. They cut down the palm branches. They spread them in front of him to smooth his path, welcoming him as Messiah, as king, as ruler. And there was no doubt that when that took place, Jesus Christ was revealed as Messiah. All those times that he had told them to be quiet, not say anything, were over with. Now he was revealed, and in just a few short days, he would be cut off. After he was cut off, that 483-year time period stopped, and there is one seven-year time period left, one week left. That is the Great Tribulation. That is the last week of Daniel's prophecy. It will restart. God will re-click that stopwatch. When the covenant is confirmed, it gives Israel peace. And in the midst of that week, the rebuilt temple will stop sacrifices. It, there will be a, an abomination that takes place there, and sacrifices given to God will stop. And at that point, the midpoint, only three and a half years are left. And at the end of this, Jesus comes back, and we see him coming in his second coming to rule and reign upon the earth.
a little bit more background and we'll wrap it up tonight. Here you see the seven churches. John, the, the apostle, uh, the evangelist, um, was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, probably to die. Some say that John had been boiled in oil before this time period, uh, that a pagan king was so upset with him and uh, wanted so badly to hurt him that he boiled him in oil, and when he didn't die, that was seen as almost a miracle. And then he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, uh, a barren, desert, rocky place in which basically to die. Uh, the island itself is uh, only about seven and a half miles long and only about four and a half miles wide. So it's very small, very barren. It's a volcanic island and uh, fitting for uh, the setting for such a vision that John is going to have of the end of the world. John is there and he writes this book of Revelation and he sends it to the seven churches of Asia, uh, churches that he had worked in, churches that he had pastored or had, had influence in and keep in mind that he is the last of the apostles. He is the last one that had a physical direct link back to Jesus Christ and as such had to be revered by those who accepted and believed in Jesus Christ. And now he has been taken, and he's been tortured, and he has been taken away from the family and friends that he had left, and he's been sent to this island to die. And if you can imagine what it was like for John to be there. The last living apostle, all of his friends, all of those that he had worked with for all those years, gone. He'd seen his Lord and Savior crucified, he'd seen him resurrected, and he'd seen him taken back up into heaven. And now John, at what had to be the lowest place in his life, exiled, uh, had to be wondering, had to be questioning, um, where was God in all this? Where was Jesus Christ in all this? And then in the midst of what had to be the turmoil and the heartbreak of his situation, Jesus comes to him, appears to him, and tells him, John, this is not the end. I haven't forgotten you. I haven't abandoned you. And I'm going to show you what's really going to happen. Someday in the future, there are going to be people just like you wondering, where is God? There are going to be people who are going through difficulties and, and wondering if it's the end of the world and the end of all things. And they need to know that I haven't forgotten them, just as I had not forgotten you. And so that's what the book of Revelation is about. It is a book of hope. It is about that great revealing of Jesus Christ at the darkest point in human history for all the world, but especially for the nation of Israel. And it's at that point when everything seems blackest, both literally and, and figuratively, that Jesus Christ comes back. Uh, the sky is rolled back and Jesus appears as lightning shining from the east to the west. And, and John is writing the letter to those seven churches and he's also writing the letter to us and writing a letter to the people of that coming age to tell them don't give up hope God is not far away he is coming back and when you need him most he's going to be there if there is a application that I want you to take from our introduction to this this book it is that whatever you might be going through however difficult it may be however broken hearted you may be and no matter how much it may seem like God is not there, understand that He is. He knows, He hears, He listens, and He's more than able to put His arm around you and hold you close. When you need Him most, He will be there, just as He was for John, and just as He will be for those people who have lived through this terrible, terrible time. God is not far away. He's very, very close. He loves us and He cares for us. And he has not abandoned us. He will be there for us. I hope you can join us again with the rest of these lessons. And I hope they'll be a blessing to you. May God bless. Amen.